I don't think most people enter marriages thinking they're going to get divorced. People have looked at these sorts of things, believe it or not, in ducks, in laboratory mice, in different types of birds. You can find examples of polygamy. You can find examples of cheating, of infidelity. You can find examples of all sorts of different behaviors that, in your own mind, you can map to human behavior. There's something about our attachment machinery that can be very compelling, such that people take on tremendous levels of commitment. I have to imagine that most people enter marriages assuming that they're going to stay in those marriages. I don't think most people enter marriages thinking they're going to get divorced. But that if 50% of those commitments end in divorce, there must also be mechanisms by which our attachments can break. And today we're going to talk about both the forming of attachments and the breaking of attachments, what can prevent those breaks in attachments, and indeed what can lead to reattachments. There are biological mechanisms to desire, love, and attachment. That's abundantly clear. Now, there's a robust and very large literature in animal models. What I mean by that are field studies and laboratory studies in primates of different kinds, such as macaque monkeys or bonobos. People have looked at these sorts of things, believe it or not, in ducks, in laboratory mice, in different types of birds, etc. And if you look at that literature, you can essentially find biological examples in the animal kingdom for just about any behavior that you can easily map to human behavior. So for instance, there's a species of animal called the prairie vole in one portion of the United States. This prairie vole species is monogamous. They only mate with one other prairie vole, only raise young with one other prairie vole for their entire life. And in another region of the United States, the same species of animal, the prairie vole, will mate with many individuals. They're non-monogamous. And the major difference, at least as far as we know, between the prairie voles in one location and another location is the levels of a molecule called vasopressin in the brain and body. Vasopressin is present in humans. It has numerous biological roles. It's responsible, for instance, for controlling the amount of urine that you excrete, the amount of water that you retain, and for sexual desire, as well as mate-seeking. Levels of vasopressin in prairie voles are strongly determinant of whether or not a prairie vole is going to be monogamous or non-monogamous. Why do I raise this? I raise this because the literature on prairie voles is quite beautiful and has been discussed quite a lot in the popular press. You can look it up with an easily just web engine search. You'll find lots of information about this, lots of news articles about this, and lots of interpretations as to how vasopressin might be involved in similar or different mechanisms in humans. Now, I don't have a problem with mapping animal studies to humans. I think there's certainly a place for that. But if we just lean back and look at the giant mass of studies in animals and their mating behavior and their mate selection behavior, you can essentially find examples of anything. You can find examples of polygamy. You can find examples of cheating, of infidelity. You can find examples of all sorts of different behaviors that in your own mind you can map to human behavior. But it's really hard to make the leap from animal models to humans in any kind of direct way. And so thankfully, there's been tremendous work done in the last mainly 20 years or so looking at human mate selection, human desire, human love, and human attachment. 